Well, good afternoon to everybody, and uh, thank you very much for the welcome and for the invitation to contribute to today's, uh, to today's event. Uh, I have to say that I'm personally quite glad that we just had a break following uh, Hanin's speech, because uh, I was left very uh, emotionally drained by listening to the stories and the reality of the Palestinians and their struggle for six decades for return, for basic dignity. And when I listened to Hanin, I was thinking, and afterwards I was thinking to myself, how am I going to uh, bridge this to a sort of, you know, PowerPoint about the reality on the ground, which is horrific enough, but in a different, in a different way. And I realized that what Hanin reminded me of was why any of us are doing this in the first place why we have the obligation to tell the truth, the obligation to show solidarity. So I'm hoping that my contribution now will help us to understand what's happening on the ground, what's happened and has been happening to Palestine for many years, and help us to think about the way in which all of those Palestinians, wherever they are living in the world, will be able to return one day. So I'm going to uh, try and keep to uh, the time limit, um, and this first section, which uh, I'll, I'll deal with more briefly at the beginning, like why do we talk about Israeli policies in terms of apartheid? Now before Hanin we had Adri's presentation, which gave us that insight into what apartheid looked like in South Africa, and then after that, or as that was happening, and subsequently how the international community came to define apartheid. Uh, and hopefully one of the things that people will take away from today are a couple of sort of key points about why people talk about Israeli apartheid and what people are saying and what people are not saying when using the apartheid framework. Uh, and one of those points is this, that while there is a very interesting an illuminative comparison with what happened in South Africa. That comparison is ultimately not how one tests the validity of talking about Israeli apartheid, precisely because of that international definition that Adri went on to talk about in the second part of her presentation. Okay, and I don't need to repeat that now. Now what's happened in the last few years especially is that more and more people have started to talk about Israeli policies in terms of apartheid. And I'm going to give you a few examples. This is an Israeli human rights organization, Bet Selim, who wrote this. The Rhodes regime bears clear, and talking about the West Bank in this particular example, <laughs> the Rhodes regime bears clear similarities to the racist apartheid regime that existed in South Africa until 1994. This is a quote by Human Rights Watch, who don't use the A word, but you can see where they're going with this. Palestinians face systematic discrimination merely because of their race, ethnicity, and national origin. And as my presentation continues, you'll see that most of my focus is on specific policy examples that affect Palestinians. And the thing to bear in mind when you're, when you're uh, hearing these policies, and I don't know, some of you here may know already about all of them, some of them may be new, but as you're listening to them, Remember that we're not just talking about isolated human rights abuses. We're talking about human rights abuses that are part of a bigger system and that serve a bigger goal. There, there are also academic studies that have taken place in recent years that talk about Israel in terms of apartheid, that's a South African think tank. And then we have the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And that's the committee that monitors compliance with the convention that Adri actually referred to right at the end of her presentation. And Israel is actually a signatory, amusingly enough, to that convention. And it's the last periodic report um, that Israel was uh, you know, presented, that had to have a review of its policies, was 2012, uh, two years ago now. Uh, and in that review of Israeli policies, that UN committee used language to describe Israeli policies unprecedented for any country since the time of apartheid South Africa. Obviously no time to go into that in detail, but they talked about the following, quote, segregation between Jewish and non-Jewish communities, a lack of equal access to land and property, 
inside the pre-67 borders. Okay? And I will come back to this question of the nature or difference or similarity between Israeli policies between across the so-called Green Line. Uh, when it came to the West Bank, uh, the UN Committee talked about a regime of de facto segregation severe enough to prompt a reminder of the prohibition of apartheid. Okay, so the UN Committee specifically had to remind the state party Israel of the prohibition of apartheid because of the nature of these policies. Now before I get into giving you some examples of what that looks like on the ground for Palestinians living under Israel's regime, I want to say a few words about Israel's uh, definition as a quote-unquote Jewish state. Because this is a very important part of understanding the very root, the very heart of the question of Palestine. And the first thing to make clear, and this is where it links back also to Hanin's talk, is the root of the expulsion of the Palestinians, of their displacement, the Nakba, in 1948. This, of course, is what enabled a Jewish state to be established in the first place. And you had around 85% of all the Palestinians who would have been inside the borders of the new state, who would have been inside the new Israeli borders, they were expelled and prevented from returning. Most of the villages were destroyed. Remember, those refugees that we've already heard discussed today, the only reason, the only reason why they did not go back to their homeland is because they're not Jewish. And the next time that you hear somebody in the media or a politician or someone talk about, doesn't Israel have a right to protect its Jewish majority? Isn't it understandable that Israel would want to defend and protect its Jewish majority? Remember that the only reason that Israel has a Jewish majority that it seeks to protect is because of the historic act of ethnic cleansing of Palestine and the ongoing forced exclusion of the people from their land. A couple more comments about Israel as a Jewish state. <coughs> After the physical act of expulsions took place in the Nakba, the Israeli government passed uh, legislation that forms a framework, a legal framework of ethnocracy, not democracy. And these are three key laws, the absentee property <coughs> law, the law of return, and the citizenship law. And sort of giving a quick summary of what those three laws do, uh, separately and together. On the one hand, the absentee property law was the key legislative instrument <coughs> used to confiscate the land of the expelled Palestinian refugees. The law of return says that any Jew anywhere in the world can emigrate to Israel and, under the citizenship law, receive citizenship. But the citizenship law was also worded in such a way so as to exclude from citizenship <coughs> criteria the expelled Palestinians. So those three laws define the boundaries of inclusion and exclusion, enabling a settler colonial state to establish these particular, uh, both physical and sort of legal metaphorical boundaries of who's in and who's out. Israel doesn't have a formal constitution, and instead it has a series of so-called basic laws which define key aspects of the nature of the state, like the role of the army and the Knesset, the parliament, etc. And I just want to highlight briefly one basic law because of its significance and what it illustrates. And that's basic law of human dignity and liberty, which was passed in 1992. Now, on, from its name, and if you just sort of skim read it, it looks like a positive law. Right? It looks like a law, it looks, or it is in some respects, a law intended to protect the rights of all Israeli citizens, including minority groups. But when you read... Uh, uh, not the small print, but when you read it carefully, you see that there's a key caveat. Part of the basic law says this, there shall be no violation of rights under this basic law except by a law befitting the values of the State of Israel. And what are those values? The values of the State of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. So, in other words, it is possible and permissible to trump and to uh, infringe upon the rights of some Israeli citizens if it is deemed necessary in order to protect Israel as a Jewish state. And that is the way that that caveat, that clause, has been interpreted by, for example, the Israeli Supreme Court. 
So those are just a few remarks about Israel as a Jewish state, part of the framework of systematic discrimination. And how that sort of has been rolled out in practice is what I'm going to spend uh, the rest of the time, most of the rest of the time, talking about. So I'm going to divide it into three sections, land and housing, citizenship and access, and military brutality. And again, of course, I'm only going to be touching upon each of these issues and not even mentioning others. Land and housing. From 48 to 1953, the first five years of the State of Israel's existence, 95%, almost all new Jewish communities established in the first five years of Israel's existence were built on the land of expelled Palestinians. Okay, to give you an idea of that whole-scale transfer of land from an expelled indigenous population to a new settler population and the state. By the mid-70s, the average Palestinian community inside 48, okay, inside the pre-67 uh, boundaries, had lost between two-thirds and three-quarters of its land. Now remember, this is not even talking about the West Bank land. Part of those policies of internal colonialism and ongoing colonialism has included what the Israeli authorities themselves have referred to as Judaization policies, particularly in the Nakab in the south and the Galilee in the north, which are two areas which <laughs> since 48 have maintained a relatively high number of Palestinians compared to other areas of the state. So those have been, that's been deep, that's a sort of uh, a source of anxiety for the state and for national and local authorities. Here's an example of a planning document um, from the Jewish Agency, which is a, kind of a, a non-state, parastate body that works with the government. And they talked, and this is from a planning document for the Galilee region, uh, and they talked about keeping Arab villages from attaining territorial continuity. Okay, so when planning uh, Jewish communities in the Galilee, one of the key goals was to be breaking up areas where there are quote-unquote too many Palestinians. Another aspect of that ethnocratic land and housing system includes the role of admission committees. Admission committees operate de facto in around 70% of all Israeli communities, and they permit or deny residency based on social suitability. Okay? And you could guess what direction that might be going in. Uh, this is, according to Human Rights Watch, those committees have notoriously been used to exclude Arabs from living in rural Jewish communities. Okay? And in an extra dark irony, I guess you can say, um, a lot of those communities that operate admission committees, especially like Kibbutzim and Moshavim, were built on the land of ethnically cleansed Palestinian villages. Israel's housing minister in 2009 a national duty, he said, it's a national duty to prevent the spread of Palestinian citizens. Rhetoric very befitting the only democracy in the Middle East, right? <laughs> you expand the, the gaze to include the occupied West Bank, and you're looking at over half a million Israeli citizens living in this network of colonies in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. You notice that in the first two decades of military rule of the West Bank from 67 onwards, the amount of Palestinian cultivated land fell by 40%. Again, another government plan looking at uh, the colonization of the West Bank specifically. The goal is to, quote, disperse maximally large Jewish population in areas of high settlement priority. And this is where I want you to start to notice, if you haven't already, the similarity between Israeli policies in areas like the Galilee and Israeli government policies in areas like the West Bank. Okay, very similar language and strategies deployed in those areas. And again, just another statistic to give you an idea. Uh, the Israeli government unilaterally declared big chunks of the West Bank as so-called state land after 1967. But despite its responsibility as an occupying power to be a sort of ruling for the benefit primarily of the occupied persons, they only allocate 0.7% of state land to Palestinians themselves. A further dimension of that is the restrictions. I mean, as settlements grow, as Israeli settlements grow, Palestinian houses are destroyed. And in 60% of the West Bank, which is designated so-called Area C, Palestinians require a permit to build. Uh, a UN study in 2008 found that Israel designed a system to fail the Palestinians. Okay, that survey was covering a seven-year period. And they found that 94% of Palestinian applications for a building permit in Area C were denied. 
So in other words, Israel designed a legal system that would make it impossible for a Palestinian to get the required permit to build. And of course, if they don't have the permit, Israel can demolish the property. In 2013, last year, Israel demolished over 500 structures, Palestinian-owned structures, as you can see here, that made over 800 Palestinians uh, lose their homes, displaced. And in 2011, European Union officials on the ground described the Israeli policy of house demolitions in the West Bank as the, quote, forced transfer of the native population. Those are the words of EU officials, the forced, trans forced transfer of the native population. Uh, and we might note here that the European Union is not too bad at documenting what happens in Palestine, but really terrible at doing anything meaningful to stop it. Second category that I want to give some examples of is from citizenship and access. Again, I'm just picking some examples to illustrate the point. If you take East Jerusalem under Israeli military rule after 67, where most Palestinians don't have citizenship, and they don't have West Bank ID, they have Jerusalem ID. Okay, but that residency permit, that residency right, can be rescinded by the Israeli authorities based on certain criteria. For example, if a Palestinian lives abroad for seven years, or if they fail the, the quote-unquote center of life test. So let's say you're a Palestinian with East Jerusalem ID, and you decide to go and study in uh, America, let's say you go and do a BA, and then you stay on to do a master's, uh, and then because you've got nothing better to do, you carry on to do a PhD as well then you risk having that right to live in East Jerusalem in your own city rescinded. Since 67, over 14,000 Palestinians have had that right to, their right to live in their own city taken away from them. And this is Ehud Olmert. Ehud Olmert, uh, I think probably most people know him from when he was Prime Minister, okay, uh, and also a war criminal. Uh, and in 1998, he was the Mayor of Jerusalem, and he said the following as Mayor in public. It's a matter of concern when the non-Jewish population rises a lot faster than the Jewish population. Okay? That's like uh, Jerusalem had elected Burt Builders as the mayor. Okay? And then, but remember, when you, see, when you see the rhetoric from Israeli officials like that, remember that it's not a fringe party or a party that takes a few seats every election or in a few areas. It's the ideology that has informed every single Israeli government from 1948 until today. In the West Bank, Palestinians' freedom to move, it doesn't exist, it's controlled and restricted by a sort of twin process of needing a permit, okay, remember the past laws in South Africa, and also physical obstacles. You've got the majority of the apartheid wall lying inside the occupied West Bank, which of course further restricts Palestinians' ability to move. And, and this, is a, this last point isn't something that actually I feel gets talked about that much, because everyone's just sort of accepted that it's happened. Israel basically makes it impossible for Palestinians to move freely between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, despite the fact that even under the Oslo Accords, which Israel is still a signatory to, uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip are a single territorial unit. And that means, for example, that a Palestinian wishing to study in, let's say, Birzeit University from Gaza can't do that. Of course, in the name of security. <laughs> and finally, a few examples uh, from the category of military brutality, because of course you cannot colonize, you cannot segregate, you cannot expel or impose apartheid without requiring brutal military repression to help you do so. Here's one example. The Israeli military routinely raids invades Palestinian communities. This is just in the West Bank. In 2012, 6,193 different invasions of Palestinian communities. Okay, so in other words, a routine occurrence day and night. B'Tselem, the Israeli uh, NGO. Israel, quote, detains Palestinians for their political opinions and non-violent political activity. Again, another famous characteristic of all robust democracies. Uh, 500 to 700 Palestinians are processed through military courts, Palestinian children are processed through military courts every year. Uh, last year, in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, Israeli forces killed 36 Palestinians. And this is a report from Human Rights Watch uh, just in January of this year. They talked about the following, quote, Israeli soldiers hiding near schools 
have killed children who pose no apparent threat. Right? The most moral army in the world. Uh, and he, this, this next aspect is something that, uh, again, I think is maybe underreported. Uh, the Israeli military impose a so-called no-go area inside the Gaza Strip. Uh, and Palestinians entering that no-go area can be shot at will uh, and killed. And you can see here that between June 07 and July 2013, so about six years or so, Israel killed 127 <coughs> Palestinian civilians in Gaza's so-called no-go area, okay, that the Israeli military unilaterally has imposed. And another way of looking at it, between March 2010 and December 2011, 19-month period, 30 separate cases that were documented of Israeli soldiers shooting Palestinian children whose crime was to get too near to the perimeter fence that keeps them in the Gaza Strip. Many of those children are collecting scrap metal and rubble, sort of sell on for a small amount of money. I think I'm doing okay with time, maybe? It's all right? Yeah. Yeah, that means no, that means no but you're not gonna stop me now. David. So, uh, I've got one last section to do, which is this, which is called Rethink to Reimagine. And this is just because I wanted to provide also uh, some thoughts about how we could be interpreting events on the ground now and thinking of a way forward. Uh, number one, I think it's important that we do something that I've described as making the links and thinking of the green line as invisible. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the green line, which most people know refers to the uh, border, so-called border between land that Israel occupied before and after 1967, that green line is invisible, not in the sense that it's, you know, not literally painted on the ground, but it's invisible in two ways. Number one, Israeli colonization strategies after 67 have rendered the green line a practical irrelevancy in terms of the place, the locations and sizes of the settlement blocks and other aspects of the colonization process. But number two, and for me, even more important in, in terms of a concept and an understanding of what's happening there, the green line is invisible because Israeli policies towards the Palestinians are the same whether you're looking at Haifa, the Nakab, the Galilee, the Jordan Valley, neighborhoods of Jerusalem like Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah, wherever you look, from the southern Hebron hills up to Akka, Israeli policies towards the Palestinians have the same goal in mind. To maintain a regime of exclusion and privilege that benefits one group of people at the expense of another group of people. Uh, this is a quotation from an Israeli academic called Oren Yiftachel, who wrote this a few years ago, and he said this, the colonized West Bank, the besieged Gaza Strip, and Israel proper, each with its own official set of rules, are merging into one regime system, ultimately controlled by the Jewish state. And I would say that the only thing, I, personally, I would change merging into merged, i.e. that has already happened. That is what exists today. What exists today is a de facto one state. If you think about it from the point of view of all the Palestinian people, one in seven Palestinians are second class citizens. One in three Palestinians are under military rule. And half, just over half of Palestinians, are excluded from the homeland altogether as refugees. This is a couple of quick map panels. This is probably something similar to what you might have seen before. This shows Jewish slash state land ownership over a period of time. So starting from the left to right, you've got uh, 1917, okay, Palestine 1917. Then moving over to the next one across, you've got 1947, okay, so just before the Nakba. The next one along is 1960, so the state of Israel has been established. And then over here on the right hand side is now, okay, and how, how the amount of land available to Palestinians has shrunk. This sequence of maps um, is more, it's practical, but also again, um, conceptual in a way, it is to do with access. So again, going from left to right, this is showing who can go where, or who lives where. So on the left hand side, coloured in black, is where you can go as an Israeli citizen. The next across is where, you can, where your area is a Palestinian with West Bank ID. Then next across, it's your area as Palestinian with the Gaza Strip ID. And then finally, blank, nowhere, is where you can go as an expelled Palestinian refugee. Two pictures, 
two pictures. There's no way that you can tell me which one of these pictures is from inside Good Israel in the pre-67 lines and which one is from the occupied West Bank. Because the same thing is happening in both places. On the left-hand side, it's in the Jordan Valley. And on the right-hand side, it's the Nakal in, uh, in the south, the Negev Desert. In this, both places, Palestinian communities are being demolished in order that alongside them or in the future, on top of them, Jewish communities can grow. So we have to rethink. Rethink so that we have an approach that is based on the reality on the ground. Not what it was like 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Not what an imaginary idea of what it might be like, but actually what it is like on the ground now. And also an approach based on the failure of the so-called peace process. It is a sort of generous concession to describe the peace process as a failure, because you can make a pretty good argument for that whole farce always having been about an everlasting process and no peace. But let's just, let's just assume that the peace process was all about bringing peace. It's obviously failed. You're two decades in, and Israeli colonization has, hasn't been checked in any, uh, in any way. We also have to rethink to move beyond occupation discourse. And it's easier for me to explain what I don't mean by that, to explain what I do. I don't mean, particularly speaking as someone sort of working within Palestine solidarity, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't focus on uh, those examples where Israeli apartheid is at its most brutal. So, such as in the Gaza Strip, where Palestinians can be massacred with impunity, or in the southern Hebron Hills, where communities face total extinction. But what it does mean is that we have to place those examples in their context, and remember that they are components of a bigger system. And, and hopefully this next point should be a little bit obvious, we have to rethink the orthodoxy about Israel's democratic credentials. I don't know too much about the sort of domestic political dynamics within the Netherlands, but in Britain, for example, uh, the deputy prime minister of the, the current British government, a couple of years ago, he described Israeli settlements in the West Bank as, quote, an act of vandalism. Right? Quite strong language from the deputy prime minister. Uh, he's a bit of an idiot in pretty much everything else, but he described Israeli settlements as an act of vandalism. But there were no serious political consequences for him for saying that, which I'm sure is why he said it, right? That he knew there was, no, there was not going to be a big sort of reprimand for him to describe Israeli settlements in the West Bank in those terms. But what you won't find our Deputy Prime Minister condemning or saying on the radio or in the media is something along the lines of, you know what? We need to have a serious conversation about whether Israel has got a so-called right to be a Jewish state because of what that means for the Palestinian people. Okay? That is the off-limits taboo topic. Okay? That is the red lines drawn, particularly in countries like Britain where in other areas the discourse has improved. But that's the area that is off-limits. And that's what we also have to resist too. Resist the efforts by a lot of people to make that a topic you don't talk about. But along with all that rethinking comes a positive act of reimagining. It's really close to the end. Reimagining so that we can think about a future that is genuine coexistence of equals. Okay, some people, unfortunately, take a term like coexistence and they use it and they abuse it to protect and justify the colonial status quo. Okay, because coexistence is not about sitting down, talking about narratives, smoking argila and then going home and feeling amazing about yourself, okay? Real coexistence is a, can only happen in the first place once you've destroyed the power structures that keep one group privileged at the expense of another group. It also means reimagining that concept of self-determination so that you're not talking about exclusivity and separation, but that you're talking about two groups sharing the same space on the basis of equality. Reimagine so that we're emphasizing things like democratization and decolonization. And finally, uh, and these words, the following words are taken from a great website and initiative called Arena of Speculation. <coughs> Reimagine so that instead of can we return or when we will return, Palestinian refugees ask what kind of return do we want to create for ourselves? <coughs> Last slide. Uh, I'm sure many people here have heard of Moshe Dayan famous Israeli leader, his father served in the first Knesset, the first Israeli parliament. Uh, and he said these words in 1950, Shmuel Dayan, Maybe not allowing the refugees back is not right and not moral, but if we become just and moral, I do not know where we will end up. <laughs> now, it's not 1950 anymore. It's 2014. 
And I think there is an answer to that rhetorical question that doesn't have to be an answer of defiance and wars and brutality and legalized privilege, but actually can be an answer of defiance and hope. And I'll finish with the words of the late, great Edward Said, who said this, Coexistence, sharing, and community must win out over exclusivism, intransigence, and rejectionism. And the only thing I'd add to that is that there's no time to lose. Thank you very much.